Okay, we're going to get started. Um, all right, uh, welcome to the wildlife section. Uh, so, he, so my talk is uh, going to be on observing wildlife and connecting it to wild, to habitat. Over the years, I've uh, collected a bunch of video out clips and observing behavior. And one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about wildlife and uh, observation and, and wildlife management, habitat management, being outside is observing wildlife. And so we're going to, I'm going to share with you um, categories of, of videos. Uh, it'll be categorized by the animal, but they're little outtakes that I've taken over the years. And, 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 and uh, I'd like you to just observe the behavior the animal's doing and then interpret it and, and talk about it. There's nothing more uh, rewarding in my mind to get outside with binoculars, sitting somewhere quietly watching. But I observe wildlife all the time. I'll be driving down the road and all of a sudden I, I slow down, pull over to the side of the road. My wife, Joanne, goes, what is it? You know, and there, there'll be, you know, it's either a deer or turkey, uh, a pileated woodpecker on a tree. It could be anything. But I love observing. Now, it doesn't matter where you are, you'll observe wildlife. But on the job, uh, I'm blessed to be able to do it as well as part of my work. So animals don't randomly occur in the environment. They need, they, they're doing something. They're going to either be seeking food, shelter, water, cover, and they're moving around in their environment. Um, and the arrangement of these four things, people will, will always tell me like, oh, you know, we kicked that animal out of its habitat. And now it's in my backyard. No, it's going to your backyard because it's looking for food, water, shelter, cover space. Very rarely are they just randomly moving around. It, it's, it's, they're going to look for something. So whatever animal you observe, it's doing something in its habitat. It's either seeking food, water, shelter, cover space. And sometimes there's unique behaviors that you, it's hard to interpret. And I'm going to share a few of those with you. Every animal has a limiting factor. So it, it's something that it seeks in the environment that that it needs. And it could be food, cover, seasonal cover, space, a patch size it could be a small area, a big area, depending on the, the season of the year. Is it nesting or is it just foraging? Is it winter? Is it seeking out winter food, spring food, summer food? And then, of course, uh, it could be, in the case of like a bluebird, it could be chased out of its habitat because a house sparrow shows up and it kicks it out of its nest. So there are issues like that. But um, um, you may have seen woodchucks in your neighborhood or, or in, a, in a farm field or somewhere in your neighborhood. And we kind of take it for granted. It's an animal that just sticks around in the, uh, you know, sticks around in the um, in, in, in field areas. Well, here is right outside, uh, right, si uh, right outside the, the facility here. I happen to uh, look over at this wood pile and this woodchuck comes out of the wood pile. Now, what I'd like you to observe is most people will just say, oh, it's a woodchuck. And then they just kind of say, okay, it's a woodchuck. But well, watch what it does. This woodchuck goes up to this and it's rubbing its, its angle glands on inside its mouth. It's scent marking that, that spot so that when it comes back outside, it will find that spot. It's going to, everywhere it goes, it, look, it's marking, marking, right? Now, it's something that we, you know, Unless you're into animal behavior, you're not going to re really observe. But now watch, everywhere it goes, it's going to be marking its territory, where it's going. And they mark a lot around their burrows. And then anywhere they go to forage, back and forth, they mark that whole territory, the whole, the whole, the whole trail. They have, a, they have oral angle glands, and then they also have a, a, gl a gland at their, at, down at their anus that also marks. And uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things going on that when you typically see an animal you don't, when you look a little further into it, they're, they're, they're doing a lot more than meets the eye here. They're set marking. Now I'm continuing to videotape this animal because I'm really fascinated by this uh, set, set marking, but watch what, watch what it's going to do in the next minute or so. Another neat behavior. Let's watch it continually.
look what it's doing. It's picking up leaves, dry leaves, and look where it's going. Watch. Keep, let's keep watching it. I didn't think I was going to see all this that day. I mean, I was neat to see the scent marking, and then I continued to watch. Look, Phil, he's going to go back to his den and lie in his den. What's really amazing about woodchucks is they, they, you know, they're, they're underground and they have many chambers. Mostly they have one entrance and two, two entrances, but they're constantly refurbishing their nest, their, their beds to, with, with clean and dry stuff. And you'll never find the woodchuck dropping. Why? Because they cover it up and they, they'll, they'll have a chamber where they basically cover up their droppings and they don't want to be, they want to keep their area predator uh, proof, in other words, so that the other predators can't smell, but they mark their territories. So uh, I'll, I'll, I was uh, actually in a study where I did, I caught over 300 woodchucks back in the day between 1986 in 1990, when I worked for the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. When I used to release the live captured woodchuck, I noticed that they would do circles until they found their track and then they would go right to their burrow. Like, so if I put the, if I put the trap out in the middle of the field where there was no, where the, where the woodchuck hadn't made a trail, it wouldn't know how to get back to its trail until it, it, it did round circles and then found, found its trail. So scent marking is very important in, in this, uh, and they're in the squirrel family. So next time you see a woodchuck, it's not just about the woodchuck. It's like, hey, how does it live its life? So you can actually start seeing their trails where they mark back and forth, how they get to the, their greener pastures where they go feed on somebody's garden or a greener field or where they're going. And then they find an escape route back to their, back to their uh, burrow. Kind of a unique behavior. They're in the squirrel family. So... Uh, the next slide I'm going to show you are some squirrels. And the only, the, the reason I'm doing that is uh, we kind of take squirrels for granted. We, we know that they, that they bury things, nuts, and they, they're creating our next forest. But much like the woodchuck, because they're in the same family, they also set mark everything they touch. They come out of their, their hole. You could watch them. The, the oral angle gland set mark all the twigs and if it rains they they set mark even heavier and then they'll make their trails now when that that animal just doesn't remember where he put the nut he set marked he or she set marked their whole trail to that spot and then when they when they bury it there's set there's scent there that it remembers and it can smell it through snow if it had to so there's a lot of you know just another way to think about i'm, I'm trying to uh give you more unique attributes or, or um, things that animals have. And, and when you look at an animal, like think a little bit further in from what you see, like you just see the animal, but think about this animal behavior. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot more involved than, what, than just what you see. And of course there's melanistic uh, squirrels too. They're, so they're just different color, color morph. They're still the gray squirrel. I was observing this blue jay sitting in this cover here. And a lot of people, you know, will, you know, maybe, maybe not, maybe they won't spend time watching this because there's a lot of cover between you and the, the blue jay, but not me, I'll, I'll observe it like, hey, could maybe a hawk fly by and try to pick it off? And you know, why is it sitting in that thicket? So, so I'll observe. And the reason that blue jay sitting in that thicket is it just got done feeding and it's filled its crop and now it wants to hide from predators. So it's digesting its food and it's being protective, trying to sit in a protective environment. And so, um, a lot of our wildlife will forage and then they'll seek cover. And that's a form, you know, that's what this blue jay is doing. He's, he's not just content to have, you know, cover around them. He wants to live, he wants to survive. So he's, he's he, he, you know, they're trying to avoid predation. And um, most of our songbirds are, are, are going to do that. So it's a, it's a really a, 
hiding behavior, a, a survival behavior that it's. So no matter where you are in the land, there's food, water, shelter, cover space, no matter where you are. If you set up a, a blind, you know, or, or you set up a little, a chair with a, you know, and you sit quietly anywhere, no matter where you pick on this, uh, in this uh, slide, you're going to observe wildlife. And uh, what's really neat that I found is do that. Sit in a, you know, it's fun to sit somewhere and observe for more than 10 or 15 minutes. Just, just ob observe what happens around you. And, and not only when you see the animal, note the animal, look, note what they're doing, you know, what, what's going on. Um, I always get a little bit of a chuckle when, uh, when I observe people trying to scare, you know, scare animals away, you know, because uh, it, it's really, a, it's a human behavior. We want to protect, you know, they want to protect this green, this golf course or this field from uh, a goose, you know, depositing about a quarter day of, of dropping. So they'll put up a silhouette of a coyote and figure, oh, this will scare the uh will scare the, the birds away what they what a lot of times we, is missing is birds figure out the thing doesn't move okay so it looks like a coyote but so so you know is it really gonna is it really gonna spook them and um you know you know so you sit there and you watch and you're like okay is it really spooking the animal well no it's not now you could make that coyote maybe move around a little bit uh, and scare them a little bit for a few minutes. But after a while, these animals have learned that that coyote is not going to, uh, you know, scare me away. So um, the unique behavior I want to illustrate here is that predator-prey relationship. If there's no action, it, there's, no, there's not going to be a, a negative consequence. So the birds are, are going to be... Uh, you know, continuing with their, their foraging behavior. Oh, you can't hear me? This one's on, but that one's going to Zoom. <laughs> so you guys can't hear me? Am I, am I better now? Okay. In this video, um, a coyote got attracted to um, turkey calling. Okay, so there's there was a um, the, the the turkey heard heard some turkey calls. I mean, the uh, coyote heard turkey calls, and you could see him right there. He's coming in. So just to give you an idea of uh, of uh, a coyote, you know, walking in the wild, it's pretty hard to see them unless you're spending a lot of time uh, in, you know, in one area. But um, the, the two turkeys that this uh, coyote came in on knew right away to fly away. You know, they flew off. Um, as opposed to those geese that uh, were watching the silhouette of the turkey, of the, of the coyote, they didn't, they didn't care. They're like, oh, we're going we're to forage in the, within two feet of, your, of the mannequin. So... Uh, the behavior, you know, needs that live behavior. Same one. And foxes will do the same thing. You'll see foxes um, coming around people's houses and they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, they, they got kicked out of their habitat. Well, no, like this one, well, I was coming into work and I happened to see this fox and I pulled over and I took a couple of video pictures of, but here it was it, it, a chipmunk had run, it ran after a chipmunk, a chipmunk went into that, into its burrow. And now it, the fox is trying to dig up the burrow. But what was really interesting, this same fox a few days earlier in the same neighborhood, I was driving by and I, I uh, noticed it was, hanging out in the backyard is the side yard of a house. So I stopped and I took a couple stills pictures and uh, I didn't have my video camera then. And uh, I noticed a gentleman threw something off his porch and the, the fox went to it and picked it up and 
and took off with it. So I don't know what he threw off of his porch, but the, the fox was in the person's yard because they were feeding them. And I was thinking, oh, fox in backyard there. I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a nice picture of this fox. Meanwhile, the fox was there because the guy was throwing some kind of food out, out off his back porch. In this case, it's actually foraging on wild food. But uh, if I hadn't stopped and uh, watched that fox, I would have thought it was just a fox in somebody's backyard. But then when, it, when it, I saw the person throw something to the fox and it went and got it and took off, I realized that people were feeding it. So they had kind of changed its behavior. But this, um, they will come out and, uh, you know, uh, forage on wild foods around people's houses, but they also unfortunately do get fed by by people as well. So um, I wanted to point out that the connection to habitat, whenever you look at geese, people um, will say, you know, why that, why do we have so many geese? You know, they're, they're, um, you know, we never saw as many geese in, in, in the last 30 years are increasing and it's habitat. So we've created lawns and tundra like environments. So they, that's why they're here. So the, the reason they're foraging on the grass is because it's tundra like environment. And what I've, what I've tried to help people understand is if they let this, if you continue to make tundra like grass, the geese, po the goose population is going to continue to grow. What if we change that lawn to a, a wildflower meadow and you let the, the grass grow a foot taller or more and have the diversity of different wildflowers and native grasses, the geese are not going to find favor on that kind of a meadow. So the answer to goose management is change the habitat, change the species, you know, change what's going to live there. So if we decide rather than putting up a coyote silhouette, we change the habitat, you might get reduced geese in your area. So I'm just trying to tie in animal behavior, wildlife behavior, and then human behavior and how we, we do things. There are three populations of geese and actually people buy hunting licenses to harvest them too. So when you look at the Canada, the Canada population that comes in from, from Canada through the East Coast, we, it only grows 5% because the hunters harvest them from Canada to Virginia. The resident population here in Connecticut grows 50% a year. So 5% versus 50%. That's because the resident population, even though there's two hunting seasons, there are not many being harvested by people. So hunters are harvesting the migratory ones, but they're not harvesting the as many as of the resident ones. And that's because people you know, it's the, the landowners are, have to decide whether they want harvesting. So um, there's an ecological uh, answer that's changed the grass to from tundra to fields, meadows. And then there's the allow harvesting of the of the resident geese. There's those are two options to reduce the population. And then some people will har will, will get um, dogs, they'll, they'll hire people, you know, train dogs to chase them off their, their fields in towns. And all it does is push them onto other fields. So you're not, you're never really solving the problem. You're just kind of moving them around. So the live predator where you let a dog chase them does work, but it just pushes them on to another property nearby. So, um, you know, just want to share that, that information. Here's another attempt here of uh, a different silhouette. <clears throat> Songbird uh, observations are neat. I've always uh, appreciated, especially our state bird, the robin. Here's one pecking away at ice to get to a morsel of, uh, of a winterberry. And, uh, you know, most of us, um, you, you know, you'll observe a bird feeder and you have birds coming in and out. When you look at how harsh the environment can be, 
this, you know, watching this bird pick away at the ice. When I, when I observe this, it's, it's kind of an awe inspiring experience because you look at this bird having to chew, you know, fight its way, chip its way for its, for its meal for that day. Right. We don't have to do that. Right. As humans, we can thaw at our food and cook our own food and everything's good. Um, this is one example of a bird foraging for winter food. There are every year, you know, there are thousands of these examples and like a resident turkey population. It always amazes me they could make it without migrating out of Connecticut, but they're chipping their way through ice a lot of times and they're trying to figure out how to find their food. Um, this, uh, you know, it's a neat, neat observation to observe uh, this kind of behavior. Um, I'll be out and about, come back to from the field. This is right outside our um, our exhibit window, and uh, you might get f birds feeding on the, uh, the you know robins feeding on red chokeberry, which is a native uh, uh, berry that's persistent. Um, you can see the acrobatic um, movements that the bird has to make to get its food all the adaptations that it's had over the over thousands and you know millions of years to to get the ability to do that we you know observing it you know how they do that how they are able to um find their food you know and and uh and survive the next the next season um uh, i i couldn't get my uh another video to go up i had a brown creeper brown creeper bird go up the bark I was out in the woods this past winter and it was foraging on little um, egg casings that it could find in between the bark. Same thing, adaptations and observation of fo foraging behavior. There's a flock that came in uh, in front of the building foraging on the same winter berry. Here's a, a flock of robins that went in and fed on staghorn sumac under a power line. In the middle of winter, again, not a lot of food out there. And uh, the same patch, when I drive by it or I stop by it, I'll observe, I might see a bluebird. I might see a flicker feeding on the same food. I might see a flock of turkeys in the understory feeding on the berries that fell off these these clusters. So um, um, just, I'm, I'm trying to uh, just share different observations of areas of, of, of that animals display their behavior. So it's something that I, uh, you know, my talk really is gonna revolve around just appreciating the efforts that in the different animal behaviors that animals uh, show and, and partake in on the landscape while and it's all around us. If we take the minute to observe it and to acknowledge it, this, you know, that that staghorn sumac is provides so much food for a variety of things. When that staghorn sumac is flowering in the spring, it'll provide pollinate, pollinator have uh, pollen for pollinators. So there's a whole food chain sur surrounding that that uh, staghorn. The, the wood thrush, even though it doesn't stay here in the winter, in the spring and in the fall, both you'll see them foraging on the same thing the robins are. You won't, you know, the, the wood thrush isn't going to chip its way through ice. I've seen hermit thrushes chip their way through ice to get to a winter berry. But a lot of times you'll see them flying together. And so just keep that in mind that migratory birds that don't stay in Connecticut, like the robin, a lot of them stay here are still benefiting from the same kind of foods. I also like to observe grassland birds because uh, we don't have a lot of grassland birds. And uh, a, a lot of times you'll, um, you'll go, you'll drive by a field or you're walking through a field and there's nothing more rewarding than when you see these guys, 
you know, here's two males um, and the female in the middle there. They're going to, they're going to make these uh, ground, ground nests and uh, uh, need to observe. And uh, see this little yellow patch on top of the bobolink, the, the male, uh, the female is very camouflaged, a lot of straw color in the female, but um, this, uh, 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 this is indicative of a male uh, bobolink and it's got a lot of dark feathers. But if you notice these, this, the, this almost looks like a seed head right here of a, of a, uh, of a grass. They blend in very closely to their environment, but their behavior, you know, when they, when they, when they stick up on top of these, you know, they're, they're, uh, you see the females more camouflage, of course, she's going to sit on the nest, but, uh, they almost, when they're, when they're, uh, when they're, they'll, they'll sit, they'll, they'll be steady and stay there for quite a while. You, you almost, they almost look like part of the, the grass and part of the environment. And if you ever see a meadowlark, this, all of these colorations right here all mimic the straw like grass environment that it evolved. Uh, foraging in and nesting in. And uh, if you ever get an opportunity to observe one, this one here came in in April. I happened to be, it was early, it was late April, early May. And uh, a meadowlark landed in the field that I was uh, uh, working. And um, you can see them right there. If you ever get an opportunity to, to observe them, they, they will literally, if they stop moving, they, they become one with that grass because of the camouflage. You'll see them, they'll, they'll hang out in just tall enough grass to hide their, their figure. And then they'll, 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 they'll just lay there and wait. You, have, you can get within three or four feet of them and then they flush off. But you could see the camouflage um, coloration there. The cottontail is interesting too, because we got two species. Everybody says, Pete. How do, how do you tell the difference between the two? So um, the only thing I can tell you is you see this little white star. If you see that, you, you know you, you're talking eastern cottontail. Which, uh, but uh, I love watching, watching them, uh, what they feed on. You know, what, are they, what are they foraging on? So if you see a rabbit out there, you look for that star because that's the only thing that's going to tell you if it's an eastern cottontail. And uh, this one, I didn't see it. Here he is eating the plantain, which is an, a non-native herb, but it's uh, part of the herbaceous environment that they feed in. And then sometimes you'll find, you'll find like, what is this animal eating? It's not, it's not food. It's not, you know, it's not plants. It's not seeds. So I took this video and I uh, analyzed it for a while and I sent it to a few people that I know that know something about rabbits. And I said, you know, I, I looked at the area, I, I got out of the car, out of my truck, I went and I looked at the specific spot. I couldn't see any seeds. I couldn't see any green grass or green vegetation. So this, he says, so one of my colleagues from Indiana sent me back a, a text. He said, it's geophagia. Like geophagia? What is geophagia? Geophagia, eating earth. And, uh, and uh, I, I guess they like to eat earth. So they'll eat vegetation. They'll eat, I mean, they'll eat soil and uh, get some kind of nutrition out of it. We don't know if it's going after the uh, sodium uh, in the soil, the salt, or what it, what it is, but they're getting micronutrients out of it. And then um, tracking the animal is very interesting. This, this is a rabbit track, and what's really cool is when you track them, they like to put their front feet like that, and then kick off with their rear feet. So you know they're going in the northern northern direction here. But anyway, this the 
you know, when you're tracking them, you want to know which direction they're going in. It's usually, it looks like a Y and they land in their front feet, kick with their back feet, land in their front feet, kick with their back feet. And, and so they're going in, in a northerly direction. We've created habitat for rabbits in Connecticut. So if you ever go to a wildlife management area, the New England cottontail is what we're targeting. We, the Eastern is, was an introduced animal, but so whenever you um, see machinery on state land, we're usually creating young forest habitat. If it's a, that's a feller buncher there that cuts and stacks the vegetation. And we're trying to create more of this seedling, see this seedling habitat, this, this, we only have 5% in Connecticut. So we're trying to create more of that. And once you create the habitat with the brush piles and the young woods and the herbaceous cover and the thicket cover, you'll start seeing the tracks and you'll start seeing the rabbits hanging around there. If you go in the middle of the woods where there's no cover like this, you're not going to find them. So the animal is very connected to their, to the habitat that they uh, have evolved in and they don't want to get picked off by predators. So you'll find them in these thickets. Now, once in a while, you'll see them out in the open, but they're always watching for predators. So if you go down to Hamanassa, you might, I always make it a challenge to count. I think I've count, counted 13 on the way out. That's like the highest number, but they do, they do like to stay out in the open, but they'll, they're quick to leave to go to cover. And of course there's natural cover that's created by hurricanes. And here at Sessions Woods, we've created patches for them. We have, this is a big patch cut we created here at Sessions Woods. These are the different ways we create habitat. I just want to tie in that we use forestry, planting, seeding, mowing, fire. And then uh, there's natural things like beaver, beaver dam, you know, where beaver create habitat, we create rabbit habitat when they abandon those areas. And all these things create good, you know, rabbit habitat. Another animal that I've found interesting to observe over the years is uh, the American woodcock. And um, here's here's a, uh, a field where there's three, there's four eggs there. And uh, you can see right here, um, there's a female sitting right, you'll see her real quick right here. Where is she? Right there, see her eyeball right there? And that's her beak, there's her beak. So the, I always told um, one of our expert uh, woodcock biologists that I was finding the, this, these woodcock in my field where, where I have a five acre field that I manage on my own. It's our, we own that, my, my family owns. And I've always said that, I always find them there in the spring. And, the attitude was, well, they only nest in woody cover. They don't nest in fields. And I said, well, I, I always find them there. So in my observations, one year, I happened to be mowing late. I mowed, I usually try to mow my fields by, by, by uh, March 1. Well, the snow cover was really heavy. And anyway, one thing led to another, and I ended up mowing in April. And this, this lesson that I learned from animal behavior was I watched a woodcock flush right in front of my tractor and I slammed on the brakes. And by observing this woodcock, I said, it only landed like 10 feet away. I said, if this bird was a migratory bird, it would have left and flown further. Why did it stop right here? You know, next, not far from the track. So I said, maybe it's nesting. So I'm observing the behavior. So I ended up uh, uh, putting on the brakes, shutting the tractor off calling my wife, Joanne, who was uh, nearby. And I said, can you uh, help me here? Because I think there's a nest, a woodcock nest. So she came over and uh, we looked around the tractor and we couldn't find it. We saw that the, the female was nearby. So something's going on. So I said, either the nest is under the tires or under the, the bush hog. So we, I started up the tractor, lifted up the bush hog, pulled the tractor to the side, and there was a nest under the bush hog, but it didn't get crushed. So we lucked out. And, and what it did was uh, 
all the years of observing the woodcock in this field, I had a sense that there was woodcock there nesting, but I couldn't corroborate that with any professional. They said they're, they're not nesting in fields, they're nesting usually in edges and thickets. So there's always exceptions to the rules, but you have to observe. So we, uh, we took the brush to cut, not the brush, but to cut vegetation. And we put it all around the, the nest and she went onto the nest and we didn't mow anymore that year of that. We didn't mow that site. Here, here, how cryptic they are. You could be, here's a, a biologist standing there and he found, he said, I see a woodcock. And I'm like, okay. So I was behind. So I started videotaping and then he's, there's a forester there coming in. He's, he's going to try to spook it. Sure enough, you're going to see, watch, it's going to, it's going to uh, take off right there. See it take off. Now they are so cryptic that you can literally almost step on them and they'll take off. Uh, but uh, really neat behavior to, to observe when you're out in the field. Um, they are very, uh, cryptic and they stick to their spot. This wasn't a nesting bird. It was migrating through in the, you could tell it's the spring or early, late winter. Turkeys are another animal that, um, that can uh, elicit um, interesting conversations with people. Um, Whenever I see turkeys, um, you know, I, I, I watch, say, okay, what are they doing? Well, this one here is preening. So you can see here it is uh, going to um, shake off its feathers because it had just rained that morning. And uh, it's going to, it's trying to uh, keep its feathers nice and uh, preened and, uh, you know, fresh, un, 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 you know, unmatted. And then it goes here to its, here it is going to the base of its tail. It's going to collect oil from the two oil glands. Then it's going to, in its bill now, that oil is going to spread it onto his feathers. Watch. You spend a few minutes watching birds, you'll, you'll, they'll reveal what they're really doing. And this is, in this case, it's preening. And now what he, he preened the, his beard. This, this is a modified feather. It's not really a, uh, it's not really a, fe it's not really a hair. It's a feather. And um, if you look right behind here, there's a female here, right here. There's a, there's a hen also preening and doing the same things. It's a little harder to see, but there's over, over 4,000 feathers that it's got to preen. So it's going to be, really taking care of its coat. And of course, I, I always, uh, when I see birds on the sides of the roads, when I'm traveling around, I always stop and watch. And this particular bird crossed right in front of the truck. And uh, I, I want to ask the audience here, what do you think, is this a male or a female? bird huh who says male so most people will say well it's got a beard there see it's got a beard well it, it 10 percent of turkey hens have beards and that they're they're a modified feather which um uh 10 percent of hens will will grow and uh and if you look there's no there's no uh, spurs on, on its legs over here. If you, if I slow it down, although, it, although, okay, right here. So the spurs would come out right here. Male, the male turkeys have a spur here. These, this is part of its feet. That's the back uh, appendage here. So there, you know, so there's no, there's no, uh, but, the hen, the hen, you can see here's the beard, but the, the hen, the, the hen is, is more camouflaged, has less 
iridescence in it. And uh, the head is a pink. You have a pinkish color and a blue. But there's no, there's no, uh, you know, no, no spurs. There's no iridescence. And there's, the head is, the head is, uh, you know, it's got the light pink. Yes. So there are, uh, there's only one variety. It's called the Eastern Turkey, wild turkey. It was, uh, um, there are different, there are four other, four other, there's Rio Grande. There's, there's a, a bunch throughout the nation, but in the, in Connecticut, there's just the Eastern, Eastern uh, wild turkey. Yeah, in Connecticut, we don't have any. The it's considered the eastern wild turkey, and there there'll be variations in color, like more white. You'll have more white. You'll have more red, red, uh, brownish red. Uh, but you know, brownish brown. You'll have variation, but it's one species. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, but I had there. There's no subspecies or sub races. Um, and then, you know, of course, the reason the turkeys are taking care of their feathers is they're going to they're going to have to survive a, sometimes a very cold winter. And you can see it's evidence here where the snow is. So they have to be within four square miles. They're going to get all of their requirements for their life in four square miles. That's what our what our, uh, you know, telemetry information when when they radio collared them and looked at their movements. So, uh, you know, he, you could see how. They need that. They need to have a very good coat, good feather coat. These turkeys are scratching just to get grass. Believe it or not, they're actually eating blades of grass. It's hard to believe. Like, uh, there is there seed under there. These these birds are eating a hundred percent blades of grass, which is amazing. That's how adaptable they are. You know, they'll eat a variety of food, but they'll also eat just plain grass. They spend most of their time, you know, scratching the ground. And the reason they don't, um, they don't migrate is because they, they pretty much find all their food sources throughout the spring, summer, fall, and winter. But scratching the ground is one of their, uh, you know, ways of foraging. And you'll see that in the woods. As you walk around in the woods, you'll see where they're scratching the ground, picking off different insects. They might find seeds. Um, it's just amazing what they do to, they rototill the forest to find their food. What the heck I did there? I have to click on that one. And a lot of times you'll find them around farms, like this is a dairy farm. And, uh, you'll they'll take advantage of the the waste grain so a lot of times i counted a hundred turkeys at that spot that day and uh they do take advantage of human uh you know human resources that we make available uh in this case it was cow manure but it had uh, uh you know scattered corn in it as well one of our biologists called that the hot lunch program but anyway <laughs> I had one, at least I said one funny thing in my talk. It's been pretty dry, but anyway. All right. Um, ground nesting birds, like here, here's a turkey sitting on a nest. I just want to point out that um, you could walk right by a turkey nest, like, and it will not leave its nest. Practically have to step on it. Here's the problem though. That turkey could be on that nest for over 26 days, sitting there incubating. And uh, if you disturb it at the wrong time during that, so it lays one egg a day up to, you know, maybe 12, 10 or, you know, six to 12 eggs. So that's already 12 days invested. Then it starts incubating. That's another 26 days. Just imagine having to sit there for over almost 30 days 
well, more than that, 40 days. You know, well, not sitting there for four days, but lay, you lay one egg a day, so that's, let's say, 10 days. Then you got another 26 to incubate. So after that last egg is, incubate, is laid, they incubate for 26 to 28 days. It's a long time. And um, the, uh, I've, I've loved to, I, I, whenever I find the turkey nest, I won't go up to it so that you bring your scent to it. But the, the biggest challenge is keeping unleashed dogs from them. That's one of the hardest challenges because, you know, predators are having a, already figuring this nest out potentially and destroying it. Imagine a, somebody's house pet. And uh, in this case, the day that I found this nest, there was a person walking an off-leash dog and it went not far from there. And I, I spoke to the person, they leashed their dog and I told them where the nest was and hopefully they're not going to go and disturb it. But it's, a, it's almost a miracle that these ground nesting birds survive at all in Connecticut because they're between the foxes, the coyotes, the bobcats, the coyote, you know, the uh, fisher, the, all the different predators, bears that, and dogs, off-leash dogs and cats. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing to, uh, that, they, that they actually can survive. But the 22 birds that were brought in in 1975 have been very successful in Connecticut because we have right the good habitat. We have good habitat for them. They're surviving because they can find food, water, shelter, cover space in all the four seasons of the year. So whenever you're out there observing a turkey, whether it's in a park, whether it's in a state forest, a private property, rural area, suburban city, uh, it's really a, a bird to appreciate because it survives and it doesn't have the luxury of flying to Louisiana like a wood duck can and go forage down there when it's frozen up here. It has to find all the things it needs. So I just wanted to share with you some of the behaviors and some of the unique behaviors, but it all comes down to survival and surviving the elements here in Connecticut. And it, it can use all of the habitats from the middle of the woods to the edges of the fields. It, it's amazing how much they, uh, and uh, this is just a quick example of how fast they could reproduce. And I don't want to give you guys a math lesson, but you can go from, from, you know, one hand and one time in five years and six years to having over a hundred thousand turkeys, if they all survived, you know, very rapid population expansion. If they, if there was no mortality, you know, if there was, they have a really high biotic potential. And I don't want to gross you out with this, but um, the, this is a crop at the base of the neck. They store all their food and then their gizzard grinds all their food. So, when you look at it, here's what is, might be found in a crop. They can collect within like an hour and a half, they can collect all this food. And when I looked at it, there was over six different berries. Here's a um, hickory nut. Here's an insect here, you see this insect? I found a snail in there. But there were six different kinds of berries. It's amazing what you find in these crops. They can survive on, they, I, I don't think there's anything they can't eat. It's amazing. This one is a, a roadkill up in Litchfield, and I opened up the crop. This car in front of me hit it and took off, and I salvaged the, the carcass. And, but let me show you what was in it. That's just to show the size. That's an acorn right there. These are uh, cherry seeds that were plucked scratched out of the ground with little radicals. See the, they were germinating black cherry seeds that they ripped out of the ground. And then here, this stuff was a spadix from skunk cabbage. And uh, that was a big surprise to me. I didn't know what that was when I looked at it originally. When I looked at this originally, this big clump of vegetation, it took me a little while to f figure out what it was, and it was the spadix, the blossom 
in the skunk cabbage. That was March. Uh, it was in the month of March that they uh, that those turkeys were honing in on them. Then there was also a lot of insects. All right, I got to wrap things up here. It's almost twelve o'clock. I can't I can't uh, share with you too much on a deer. I probably should have done this earlier, but but um, the grazing deer. I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to show you these videos. Um, deer always fascinate me. Here's a deer eating aquatic vegetation. All right, right here. You watch. You watch it. It's going to it's going to go in the water and eat the aquatic vegetation. A lot of people ask me, you know, do deer need water? Well, yeah, they do, but they all, they'll also eat the aquatic vegetation. There he is. There she is eating. Here's deer eating mountain laurel. I was, I was observing this, this small herd of deer, and all of a sudden I saw him go over to the mountain laurel. People say mountain laurel is poisonous. Well, deer can eat it, and they'll eat it. Whereas goats can't eat it, sheep can't eat it, whereas deer have adapted to being able to forage on it and it doesn't kill them. So it's a, actually a, a winter food. So here you can see them, see them foraging on the on the laurel there. See it? Here's a deer feeding on uh, winter vegetation, leaves. But what's really neat, watch, if you continue watching this, they just eat a bunch of leaves and twigs. Let me see, where's the... Uh... Then they bed down. After, they, after they're foraging, that, that deer is chewing the cud. It's regurgitating its food, has multiple chambers in its stomach, has multiple chambers stomach. So it's just like cows, they will forage within an hour, an hour and a half, they get all their food. Then they bed down in a place where they could see, smell, or hear predators. And here's uh, the the deer is regurgitating its food and rechewing it. And it's it's an adaptive behavior to avoid being eaten by predators, because by eating their food rapidly, then they could go find a place to hide. And uh, they'll do this to avoid predation, to, to avoid to avoid being eaten by predators. It's a strategy, rumination. This is a deer that's eating my planted elderberry. Okay, I planted a patch of elderberry and I just so happened to observe this deer one day. Here's a fence that I put around my elderberry and the deer basically like a hedge trimmer, hedge trimmed all the, but they'll forage on, a, on anything. All right, we, we got to wrap up. All right, guys, I tried to, uh, I, it's a, I tried to do this talk as a, uh, as a um, you know, animal behavior talk, uh, but uh, Connecticut always fascinates me. You could you could be somewhere and see something like I thought I was out west when I saw this deer. I was like, really? Is that an elk? Anyway, uh, that's Connecticut. It was in it was in July, and I happened to have my camera. I was walking by a field, and I see this beautiful deer grazing the grass and uh, majestic uh, animal. And, um, and it's in velvet. You know, here's velvet. It's in velvet. The antlers are going to, uh, they grow throughout. They start growing in April. And they, they stop growing around September. And then the velvet falls off. And then uh, the the antler is is not, doesn't have any nerve endings on it once the velvet falls off, but um, observing it is is amazing, you know, making observations. All right, Trent, if I could have the lights. All right, guys, I, I, I it was my uh, my attempt at, at doing something different with animal behavior, so I took a little risk, but I wanted to share with you guys the. Uh, just observing animals from a behavioral viewpoint, trying to tie in the habitat component to it. Um, there's, there's literally, you know, 
an infinity amount of observations you can make. And all I could leave you with is um, uh, there's nothing more rewarding than to, to enjoy the wildlife around us and observe the unique behaviors that they have. But always remember that it's, they're connected to the habitat. Whatever they're doing has a connection to the habitat. Whatever behaviors they're, they're, they're create, you know, that they're doing is connected to the habitat. But, but appreciating them and observing them is, is very rewarding. That's kind of my message. All right, thank you.